Have you ever opened a cold paste and thought, wow, who hurt you? It's like someone took your little neat project and fed it steroids. No, God, please, no, no! There are files you didn't even know could exist and functions are nested so deep into the code base that you need scuba gear to find it. Oh, hell no! But that's the reality of large scale software. It's not chaos, it's more like organized chaos. That's a big difference. In this video, we are going to take a closer look at cal.com, an open source scheduling application that's redefining how meetings are booked. And the best part, it's completely open source. And you know what, as a side note, it's making millions of dollars. Not a big deal, right? Before we check out the code, let's first of all see how Calcom works to understand it even better. So it's very simple. You sign up or log in, you check your availability and update it if needed. Then you create your event type, add a title, add a duration and voila, you've got a shareable link that you can send to your business partner, to your friend or even to your dog trainer. They pick a slot and boom, your calendar is updated, scheduling magic. Oh, and as a side note, if you stick till the end of the video, you'll have the chance to win a gift card for the cal.com merch store to grab some cool merch as you see right here or as you see with my cap. And without any further ado, let's dive into the cal.com code base. Let's see what they know. Let's see what they do. And let's see what we can learn from that. So let's go. So I have downloaded the code base and as you see, it's huge. It's it's super overwhelming because you have so many folders and files. For example, you open the apps folder, then you have a web folder, then you have a, I don't know, app folder, then you have a settings folder, then an admin layout, then a admin folder, then a flags folder, and then you have a page.tsx. So as you see, it's super nested, but to be honest, that's the reality of most large code bases. And I know at first glance, it looks super overwhelming, but to be honest, it's relatively organized. And if you look at the project and if you work with the project a bit, it makes sense to you and you get custom to it. But let's be honest, we don't really want to look at the folder structure. Let's look at something a bit more interesting. So the first thing which I wanted to see is what technology they use to create this big application. So if you look at the package.json, you see a lot of dependencies and we don't need to look at all of the dependencies. Let's look at the interesting ones. And the first thing you'll see is that this project uses TypeScript. This is relatively interesting because most big code bases don't use JavaScript, TypeScript or anything like that. Most big code bases use Java, PHP, Laravel, then a bit of uh, vanilla JavaScript and stuff like that. Seeing a TypeScript project with right here, Next.js is something very, let's say, not something very popular in most projects. If you look at it closely, you'll see they use Next.js 13.5 with React 18. This is interesting. They use the pages router, not the app router, because in the present time, I think we have Next.js 15 point something, which uses the app router primarily, at least they market the app router very heavily. and. Calcom still uses Next.js 13 with the pages router, probably because they don't want to migrate right now. It's a lot of work. It takes a lot of time and a lot of pain. And I don't really think they are right now looking at that. That's why they use Next.js 13. You will also see they use Next off. This was relatively interesting for me. This means they don't use a third party service. They do everything themselves, which also means they handle the security themselves. Also, you will see that they use Prisma. This is relatively interesting because from my experience, most large code bases use either their own ORM, which they coded, or they use some super old ORM, which is a pain to use. So it's very interesting that they use Prisma, a relatively modern ORM. And they use also a lot of other technologies. For example, you can open the .env file and you'll see they use, for example, SendGrid for emails. They use Postgres, which is uh, hosted on Heroku. They also use, I don't know, Sentry for errors and stuff like that. So relatively modern technology. What you will also see is that this project uses Yarn as a package manager. What you will also see is that they use Turbo Repo as a mono repo. So this means they have a mono repo design. The project is a mono repo and they use Turbo Repo for that. That's also relatively interesting because in my opinion, or when I look at it, they use Yarn as a package manager. So it would probably be quite normal to also use Yarn for the mono repo. 
but I guess Turbo Repo is the modern alternative, so it makes sense that they use it. And maybe some of you wonder what the difference is between a mono repo and a multi repo. So most people, including me, we use multi repos. This means each package has its own Git repository. So as an example, if you create a project, Shoe Marshall, an e commerce project, then you have one Git repository. A mono repo is one Git repository with multiple packages inside of there. So you don't create four separate repositories, so multiple Git repositories, but you have one single Git repository, which is then a mono repo, a mono repository. One repository with multiple application packages, whatever you want to store inside of there. And let me show you that in the code base. So for example, they have a packages folder, they have a scripts folder, then they have an apps folder, and inside of here you have the storybook folder, then you have something for Swagger and for the web application. So the web application is its own Git repository, the Swagger folder is its own Git repository and Storybook in theory would also be its own Git repository. But because they use a mono repo, turbo repo, everything is bundled in one repository. Nevertheless, they are still broken down into separate repositories, if this makes sense. So if you again look at the image right here, let me open it in a new tab. They have multiple packages. This means again, they have the web folder, then they have the Swagger folder, then they have the Storybook folder. These are separate packages, but they live in a single Git repository. If you wouldn't use a mono repo, then you would break these packages into separate repositories. So now you know how this project is structured. You know how the code base looks like. You know how it's built fundamentally. This means, for example, they have a mono repo design. They use Next.js, TypeScript, Postgres, Prisma, and stuff like that. You also know how the mono repo itself works. But now the question comes, what can we learn from this code? code base. And the first thing which you can learn is error handling. Most people, including me, we handle errors on a quite basic level. As an example, in my website, if the user has some sort of error, I just catch it and return something like, hey, Hmm, something went wrong, who cares? With cal.com and with most big projects, if you go through the code base, you will see that the error handling is quite in depth. So for example, this is the sign up route and the sign up route is relatively simple. That's why I can show it to you right here. You see, they first of all try to sign up the user, they check everything. And then at the end, we have a catch statement. We check if this is an HTTP error. If yes, we return the status with the status code, a message, stuff like that. If it's not an HTTP error, then you see they do a logger.error. This is some sort of error system that they use so that they can handle it and that they can see it in their dashboard. And you also see we return a 500 and say internal server error. So this means if we don't have an HTTP error, then there's something fundamentally wrong with the server or with the code, which means it's an internal server error. But if it's an HTTP error, then the web application itself works, the server works, but there's some sort of let's say base layer problem, which is not really a problem that cal.com internally has. So in my opinion, most small code bases don't really handle errors, including me. I do it on a very basic layer, but this is not good. In my opinion, we should all strive to handle errors better and more often. And that's something which I will take from this code base and implement in my own. For example, for my sign up route, because the error handling is super basic and that's not what you want. So before we wrap up this video, there's still a few things which I want to show you. And that's first of all, the naming of functions and variables. If you look, for example, at this function, it says function ensure request is post. Huh, that's very descriptive. If I look at the name, I understand what this function does. It checks that this method, the request is a post request. Right here, we have an if check. Is premium username enabled? Ah, I understand what they check. Then we have return await self-hosted signup handler. Okay, I understand what they do right here. So as you will see with most large code bases, they have very descriptive variable names and function names. They don't have a lot of comments. Right here they have a few comments as you see, use a try catch instead of returning response every time. So they do write comments, but not a lot of comments. What they try to do is create very descriptive variable names and function names so that the user or in other words, the developer sees what the function itself does. 
That's quite nice because in most large code bases you won't see a lot of comments, but you will see very descriptive variable names. As an example, in my projects, often variables just have the name constant get admin, constant sign up. It's not very descriptive and that's something which I will take away from this code base and try to implement in my code base. I want to make my variable names way more descriptive as you see right here. Another thing which you'll see with large code bases is that they often use testing. As an example, right here they use the test. This is a testing library. In most basic applications and also in my applications, I don't really use testing. In my opinion, often it's just overthrown. You don't need it. It just takes too much time. But in large code bases, it makes a lot of sense to have testing because at the end of the day, if your project goes down, well, this is money which is lost and that's not what you want. In my personal applications, it does not really matter if the application is down for five minutes because I messed something up when I deployed the application. With large code bases like cal.com, testing is very important and it makes a lot of sense. Does it mean that you should also implement testing in your small application? Probably not, to be honest. But once you work on large applications, once your application makes money, it makes a lot of sense to implement testing. And the last thing which I want to talk about is deployment. So let's go to the sign up route and instead of saying await check CF turnstile, I would say check CFFFF turnstile token. I would save it and then I would go to the right side to my source control and I would just commit it and commit it to the main repository. With large code bases like the codebase from cal.com, this does not work. What you would do is create a pull request. So you would save this, then you would create a pull request, send it to the Git repo, and then some sort of manager or two managers or three managers would review your pull request and then either merge it or say, hey, your code is quite bad, please work on it again, and then try to create another pull request. This is quite standard for large code bases that you create a pull request and it gets reviewed and then it gets merged. Is it something that you should also incorporate in your application? Probably not. If you don't have any employees, then there's nobody who will review your code. So if you're only a one-man team with one project, then just deploy to main, it's fine. But once you have a few employees, once your application gets bigger, it makes a lot of sense to copy this workflow, to create pull requests, to review them, to merge them and stuff like that. So yeah, everyone, what should you take away from this video? Well, first of all, error handling is super important. Please focus even more time into error handling. I will do it for myself. Error handling was always something which I just threw in the bucket and said, hey, I will do it at some point. This is not something which you want to do. Please focus on error handling. It's super important. And if you want to get hired, knowing how to handle errors is also super important. Secondly, testing is something which you should learn but probably not something which you should implement in every application. If it's just a small web application, then testing won't make any sense. But having the skills of testing is super important, especially once your code base becomes bigger or once you work at a company like cal.com. And the third thing which you should take away from this video is the difference between a traditional repo and a mono repo. In most examples, again, it does not make sense for you to create a mono repo. But once you have an application with with multiple packages, with multiple dependencies, and for example, a mobile app and a web app, it makes a lot of sense to create a mono repo. And mono repos is also a skill which you should probably know. So I would probably learn mono repos, how they work, how you can implement them yourself, but it's probably not something which you need in your project. It's something which you will need once your project becomes big and maybe then you can migrate to a mono repo design. But I would always start with a single repo and then if needed, I would upgrade to a mono repo. Oh, and before I forget it, please make your very names as descriptive as you can. Don't name it constant admin, constant verification. Make it more descriptive. Constant is admin. Constant user is verified. Something like that so that if a user comes and opens your code base, the user instantly understands what the function, the constant, the variable, whatever tries to achieve. 
Okay, friends, so I hope you could learn a lot because honestly, I learned a lot from analyzing the code base and I will definitely implement a lot of the things which I mentioned. And before I let you go off to watch some Netflix or YouTube or to implement what you have learned in this video, I want to first of all also give you the gift card code. So if you want to grab a cool cap or this t-shirt or anything that is right here on this website, well, then copy this <laughs> code which I will share on top, or on the right side, or on the left side, or on the bottom, somewhere you'll see a code. Copy it, go to the merch.cal.com website or head over to the YouTube description, click on the first link or second link, then you will see the website and then you can see what you can get. I don't know how many codes we have, so if you will get an error, then I'm sorry, then the codes are already all used. But if your code works, then please don't forget, add me on X or Twitter, whatever you want to call it, and I will repost it. And without any further ado, enjoy your day and bye.